thank you so much for being here. If you guys would just stand up and let's praise Jesus this morning.
want to find your seats remain standing with me thank you guys for coming out on this beautiful beautiful cool rainy dreary morning thank you Jesus amen, amen. come on that's yes that is nice especially for a pastor that likes to sweat while he talks my goodness holy cow well thank you guys for being here we're gonna dive into worship and as you guys can tell uh, Angie is not here she is on a uh, much needed and properly due vacation. So she is out, along with other team leaders. So you'll see all of our uh, volunteers this morning, they're, uh, they're doing their thing, um, not like aimlessly like their leader list, but uh, we've trained up our people pretty well here. And so if you see our greeters, anyone that, just tell them thank you, say thank you. They're, they're all pretty stressed out this morning because you know Jan's not here or, or uh, Deb's not here, Angie's here, so they're all a little stressed. Uh, but I think the worship team did a pretty good job, huh? Yeah, you guys give it up for them? One of the things that we were praying for specifically this morning is that during the times of worship and during the times of the message that there would be special moments. And, uh, and I, the question that, is, that needs to be asked is, you know, what is, the, what is a special moment? And for, for many of us, that's, that can be so many different things during a time like this. But specifically for what I've been praying for you is that you would have an authentic encounter with Jesus Christ this morning. Like an authentic encounter, not just we're here to hear about him, but you would experience him through his Holy Spirit this morning. Because did you guys know that that is possible for you? That is possible. Jesus is alive and well, and he wants to be with his people in this house. And so we're going to be going into songs here and talking about just how great God is. And in fact, Scripture is chock full of, of, uh, of things that talk about how great God is. Jeremiah 10, 6 says, There is none like you, Lord. You are great, and great is your name and might. First Chronicles 16 says, For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Psalms 96, 4 says, For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared and respected above anything else. There's a lot of things this morning that are gaining for our attention. There's a lot of things this morning saying, you need to worry about me. There's a lot of things this morning that are saying, you need to put everything aside and put all your, your hope and your fears and your energy and your focus and all this stuff in me. But let me tell you, Jesus is the only name. Is the only name that you should be putting all your hope into, all your love into, all your faith into. He's also the name that you can run to in the midst of your fear, in the midst of your despair, in the midst of your hopelessness. Jesus actually desires for you to bring that to him so that scripture says that he can wrap you in his peace that surpasses all understanding. So this morning, let's not just sing about Jesus. Let's sing to him. Amen? So would you guys pray with me? Heavenly Father, this morning we come into your presence. We come into the place what we would call the Holy of Holies, which was once divided by a curtain saying no human should enter through here since your son Jesus died on the cross and that veil torn in two, we are able to walk boldly and confidently into the innermost parts and lay at your feet and say, Jesus, would you meet me in the midst of my mess, in the midst of my despair, in the midst of my joy, and in the midst of my gladness. And Lord, we know the scripture says that you gladly meet us in this place. So Jesus, we're not going to sing about you. We're going to sing to you this morning. 
because you and you alone are worthy.
Father, we just thank you for this time of worship, Lord, and we just ask that you prepare our hearts for what Vaughn is about to preach, Lord. We just ask that you speak words into our lives, Lord. We just love it. Go ahead and find your seats, church. Well, good morning. Let's try that one more time. Good morning. Good morning. You guys are looking good today. You guys look nice. Maybe because I got a haircut and so my vision is better. I don't have like hair down here. That could be it too. I don't know be what it is. Hey, before we get rolling, uh, as you guys may know, uh, last Sunday was a special Sunday uh, because it was Serve Day Sunday. And uh, what we do is we, rather than gathering corporately like this, um, we actually go out in the community and do various serve projects. And uh, we do have a video that we want to show you. So um, I guess turn your attention to the screens and check out what we did last Sunday. delivering cinnamon rolls to the community to help spread the love of Jesus. Some of them have scriptures on them, so hopefully that they'll look in the Word of God and really take it in and maybe even find their way to Rock Church or any church in the community or go into the court and to the fire department and Picking up trash. There's a lot of trash out here, and we're, well, we're getting there. I think it's really nice that we get to come and do our part in the community and really help make it better. Good morning, Shelby. We are serving breakfast this morning for the Lincoln Connection. And what all goes on at the Lincoln Connection? The Lincoln Connection is our local um, community homeless shelter. And what are we serving for breakfast this morning, Shelby? This morning we're serving um, pancakes, sausage, and uh, orange juice and coffee. And it's served with lots of love. Yes. And you only get love from the Rock Church. That's correct. And how many messes have you made this morning? Well, Melissa wants me to tell, tell you that there's zero messes, but her daughter, Whitley, made a huge mess on the counter over here that we had to uh, wipe up. You're fired. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> you guys give it up for what took place last Sunday? So we do that uh, once a year, and I encourage you, if you uh, missed out on this, uh, this time around, I encourage you to be a part of it next time. It's one of my favorite Sundays because uh, what you don't see there is um, the various conversations that took place uh, with people at the homeless shelter and blessing them, and the conversation that took place on the trails, uh, people wondering what we were doing. They were thanking us and able to tell them, you know, who we are and why we're doing it. And so there was, uh, while we're doing some manual work, there's also some spiritual conversations that did take place. And so it was a really, really special time. So if you missed out, don't worry. Next year, we'll go ahead and do that one. So today, let's go ahead and get right into it. Open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1, starting at verse 1. We're starting a new series called The Good Work. Everyone say good. good. Everyone say work. work. Everyone say good. good. Everyone say work. work. Man, when you guys say the word work, your tone goes way down. Good work. Good work. 
Yeah, we, we don't like the word work, do we? It's not the, the best term, best word that we actually like um, kind of just talking about. But we're going to be talking about a good work. But before we do, I want to share another word with you. And I believe we have a slide back there. If we don't, don't worry about it. But it's got a picture of it. You can throw it up there if we do. But it's the word metamorphism. Everyone say metamorphism. metamorphism. That was all right. It was... <laughs> It was all right. This is not a biblical term by any means. This is actually a geology term. I am not a geologist, so if you are in this room this morning or online a geologist, please give me some grace as I talk about what this is. Metamorphism is when a solid rock or kind of sedimentary rock, kind of surface layer rock, um, kind of gets intense pressure from its surroundings. And what happens to that sedimentary rock, it actually changes its mineral and structural build within to support itself in that pressurized environment. In fact, this is metamorphism is actually where we get rock like marble and slate and granite. All that stuff was rock that was on top and then over years, depending how many years or, or hundreds or thousands of years, uh, it gets buried beneath more top layer of rock. And as it goes down beneath, the pressure and heat intensifies and it kind of crushes it together and the rock goes through this really strange change where it changes its structure, it changes its mineral evidence in order to support itself from the outside pressure that's putting it on that rock. And in fact, what's interesting is that under the intense pressure and underneath the rising heat, the sedimentary rock that is worthless beforehand actually goes through a metamorphosis and where it becomes sturdy and actually valuable. How many of you guys have put some new countertops in that was like slate or marble or any of those things? I haven't because it's what? Expensive, right? That's what it is. But all that, 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 that special type of rock. And kind of keep that term in mind, this geological term. You're not going to be quizzed on it by any means. But it's actually kind of a concept that we're going to be taken to as we look at 2 Timothy. If you guys have ever read 2 Timothy, it is a, a letter or, or an epistle, as we say, uh, from the author uh, Paul. Paul is kind of seen as a spiritual father figure with Timothy. And currently they're in Rome. Well, Paul is in Rome anyways. He's actually in prison. It's about 67 after Jesus' death and resurrection. And Emperor Nero, if you don't know him, he's a really bad dude. He's kind of like a, the main antagonist, if you will, in the New Testament. And Emperor Nero is ruling at the time, and he's gone into just complete madness, mainly because 50% of Rome caught on fire for whatever reason. This just caught on fire and just how things were built and their lack of preparedness, things just kept getting caught on fire. So about 50 to 60 percent of Rome is burnt down at the time. Nero is just ticked off at the world. So what does a ruler do when they're in societal collapse? They find a scapegoat, right? We see this with dictator Hitler and the Jewish people. It's the same thing. It's a very common trait down history. And so Nero says, I need to find someone to blame and look who is available. The Christians in the Christian church. And so you'll see, and you can read this in your history books, books you, can, you can learn about these things, you can go to the library and check out a book and see, watch videos about this, it's very real things. But what happened is Emperor Nero, he begins to persecute the Christians and the Christian church through persecution, threats, and murder. And Paul, who's the author of Second Timothy, was actually kind of caught up in this persecution. So right now, as he's writing this, he's in a kind of a dark jail cell, and he's writing this, giving his last words to Timothy, and rightly so, because if you guys know your biblical history, history, shortly after writing this letter, he actually gets beheaded. He actually dies. And so this letter is not just some ordinary letter happening in Timothy's mailbox. This letter is kind of like the, the, state, of, the, the state of Union address pretty much for the church at that time. And he's saying, Timothy, this is what you need to know before I get put to death. I guess, you know, you could also say the, the pressure was getting really high. It was going to intensify. And I was kind of writing this, and, and I was talking with a few people over the last couple months, and some of the common verbiage that I hear a lot is, what do we do as Christians when our culture is going in the direction that it is going right now? Can we all agree our world is going down? 
Can, can we agree with that? I'm not being a Debbie Downer. I'm just stating fact out there. We all see it. There's, there's earthquakes. There's natural disasters. There's famines. There's great uh, uh, just mass shootings and murders and, and scandals and all these different things that are happening. And I think anyone, even if you happen to be an alien looking out outer space and look down to earth, like you would say, like, wow, this, is, this world is not in a very good condition right now, especially for the church, especially for the church. Now, here, here's what I want to say with this, because it's easy to say, oh, whoa, it's me, I'm a Christian, and the world's collapsing. Ah, oh, you can do that, but that's not, that's not going to fly here, because God says, hey, don't be surprised when you have what? Trials and tribulations. In fact, you're supposed to count it as what? Joy. And so while we can say the world's going to hell in a handbasket, we can also say this is the best time more than ever for the church to rise up in the midst of pressure. In fact, you can write this down. This is the big idea is we are going to be put under pressure. No doubt about it. It's going to happen. And our only options are to burst or to be refined. We're going to be put under pressure. Like, you cannot escape that if you say you follow Jesus because essentially, as soon as you say yes to Jesus and you live by his principles, you're essentially painting a target on your back, not only for the enemy, but also for this world. And when you have a target on your back, that pressure is going to intensify. And you can either, one, you can burst underneath it, explode, implode, whatever you want to do, just say, forget about it, I'm leaving all of this, or you can be refined. And this process of refining, it takes work. In fact, it, it takes the good work that Paul says as he's encouraging Timothy through the second letter. And it's the same message that I really want to encourage you all with this as well because we're under a lot of pressure. I'm going to explain why here in a bit. But will you guys do this one thing with me really quick? Will you guys pray with me as we dive into uh, this second letter to Timothy? Heavenly Father, I pray over the next few moments that you speak loudly and you speak clearly to us. Because, Lord, we are, we are going to be under pressure if we're not under pressure right, as right now. And, God, we can either explode, we can burst, or we can be refined. In fact, you call it, this, under this, this, this type of pressure, the refiner's fire. Lord, I pray as the Rock Church and those who call the Rock Church their home church, Lord, that we would ought to desire to be refined during this pressured time. In your name, everyone said? Amen. For your note takers, today's title is called Holding On. Everyone say holding. holding. Everyone say on. on. Everyone say good. Yeah. Everyone say work. work. Oh yeah, we're getting better at that one. I like it. Awesome. Let's go ahead and start reading. We're going to start at uh, chapter 1, starting verse 1, 1 through 7. We're actually going to read all of this, but I'm going to stop in three different parts to kind of share an observation with you. So 2 Timothy chapter 1, it's on the screen, it's behind me. But it says, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I have been sent out to tell others about the life he has promised through faith in Christ Jesus. By the way, that was Paul's job, and that's our job as well. I'm writing to Timothy, my dear son, it's his spiritual son, May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. Then Paul actually gets right at it. Verse 3. He says, Timothy, I thank God for you. And God, I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted. And I will be filled with your joy when we are together again. I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. If you have a highlighter or a pen, underline that in your Bible. It's very important. And I know the same faith continues strong in you. This is why, verse 6, this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Everyone say fear. fear. And timidity, but of power. Say power. power. Love. Say love. love. And self-discipline. Say self-discipline. Here's the first point for you guys this morning. The good work is a cooperation. The good work is a cooperation. There's two things I want to point out right here from the first seven verses. Firstly is this. When Paul is exhorting Timothy about his faith, do you see who Paul gives the credit to? His grandmother and his mother. That's very, very important this morning. 
If you are a grandma or you are a parent or you're a grandpa and you're a dad or a mom, this is key for you. Now, what you may not know about Timothy, but we can read in the book of Acts, is that Timothy believed in Jesus through one of Peter's earlier mission trips, and so did Timothy's mom and grandma. However, Timothy's dad didn't. In fact, one of the letters that Paul writes, says Timothy's dad is a Greek, meaning that he follows the Greek various gods that they have. And so Timothy's earlier faith wasn't actually just a very good church faith that we think of like the mom and dad go to church, his grandparents go to church, it's a beautiful little church, and you know, little Timothy grew up to be a Christian believer type of deal. That's kind of what we have today. Timothy actually grew up in a very split household where his, his grandma and his mom became believers in Jesus, but his dad worshiped the pagan gods of the Greeks. The reason that's an issue is because in the Greek culture, just like any type of that culture, it was the husband that ruled the roost. So actually, not only did the husband, what he says goes, he actually get to pick the religion that the house has to follow. But here we read this, that Timothy, he, he's not following the Greek gods. Neither is his mom or his grandma. In fact, they're kind of having, if you will, kind of an undercover church where his grandma and his mom got saved, and then they were bound and determined to make sure Timothy followed the same God as they did. So Timothy kind of grew up in this split household. Parents and grandparents in the room, here's the first thing you need to know, is that the good work is a cooperation, meaning that it is divinely created. Please keep that word in mind, divinely. It is divinely created in this world that the family unit, whether it's a mom and dad or just one mom or one dad, or maybe you have no parents in the picture and you're with your grandparents, or maybe you were adopted, I was adopted, any of that type, it is divinely created that your family unit would be the major component in developing your son's and your daughter's faith. Let me repeat that one more time. Because we are taught that if you want to grow as a Christian, you need to go to what? Church. Church. And if you have any questions or anything about the Christian faith, the person that you go to is who? The pastor. Which that is fine. I'm here to serve you. The church is here to serve you. But actually, we are kind of an add-on, if you will, to your faith. The main people in your life that is supposed to help you steward your faith in Jesus is the family unit. You can see that all throughout Scripture. You can see that with the covenant uh, of between Abraham and, and Isaac and Jacob and all throughout the, the New Testament. It is divinely created for the family to be instrumental in equipping the sons and daughters of the next generation by building their faith through stories, practices, and gatherings. Now, some of us might be thinking, well, you know, my spouse doesn't really believe. My spouse isn't even here. In fact, they're, 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 how am I supposed to do this if it's a split? All I'm saying is I see where Timothy came from, and I know if his mom and his grandma can do it, surely God, God will bless your endeavors as well. It'll be hard, and it'll be difficult. But if God blesses their efforts, he'll bless yours. Parents and grandparents, if I can, if I can give you permission, kids, students, plug your ears because you're not going to like this, what I say. But parents and grandparents, be involved in your children's faith. Be involved in your children's and grandchildren's faith. Second thing I want us to say here is God will not work through us as if you and I are robots waiting to be moved around by God's hand. Rather, God is asking us, the part where Paul says, fan into flames the, the spiritual gifts that you received once I laid my hands on you. A lot of times, we do, this, we do this a lot of the times. This is why we had serve day, in fact. It's because sometimes we'll say, Lord, I'm here, use me. And you're still standing in the same place where, where you were before. It, it's kind of like the whole concept of, have you, has this ever happened to you? And I say this as well, so I'm not dogging on you if you say this, but, you know, have you ever, someone's kind of shared, like, they need help with something? And rather than saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll go ahead and chip in, you're like, hey, if you need help, call me. You know what happens? They don't call you. <laughs> and we do the same thing with God. God, if you need me, just call me. All while God says, no, that, 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 was, that, that was a part of surrendering your life to me in the first place, that that, that was my call at that time. 
when you came to me and repented and asked me to save you, and I did, and as a part of that, you were supposed to go out into the ends of the earth and do a good work. And Paul's saying right here, he, he, he's saying, you know what, Timothy, continue to fan in the flames the good thing that God is doing, the good work that began you. And what Paul is saying is that the good work doesn't just naturally happen by itself, but it takes actually a work on our part. Because remember, the good work is a what? Cooperation. Now, let's be a little transparent for us. Very few of us, including myself, have been in a place that Timothy is in, Okay. Pastoring an entire region of Christians, not only in, in Ephesus, but also in the surrounding areas. He's leading kind of a multi-site church, if you will. Not only is he leading a multi-site church, but he's also leading in one of the worst times in Christian history, where if you are found, you're thrown in Nero's circus, where you get eaten alive by, uh, by, by lions and tigers and all these different things. Like, it is not a good time to be a Christian during this time in this letter. And so, I, it, it's, it's very easy to think, well... Uh, I'm not Timothy. And it's because you're not Timothy. Timothy led at a very horrible time. And it's, it's not surprising that Timothy would be maybe a little timid, maybe a little fearful, not only to his young age at that time, but also it was just a massive responsibility that was on his shoulders. However, I can say many of us, including myself, can be at times fearful, we can be timid, during times where God has asked us to do something on his behalf, and with that fear and with that timidity, it also feels like we're powerless. And we have no control absolutely over anything. And so what would you? We back down from what God has called us to do. We go back to that thought, God, if you need me, just call me. And we just leave him there. Especially, especially right now. We are living in a time unlike before. And if I, and if I didn't tell you that I don't worry about the Christian faith, I, I would be lying. I worry for the church. I do. I worry not just for our church, but I worry for the church as a whole. Not because I'm in fear like, oh God, like the church will disappear and God loses. I'm not worried about that. But I am in worry and sometimes in fear over what culture will do and if specific churches, including ours, will our church rise to the occasion when God does call. Because that's going to happen. I do believe Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back soon. But he says, before I come back, before I come back, things will shake, and things will burst, and things will open up that you didn't even know I was there. But also in the midst of that chaos, you will see my divine hand, and there will be opportunities for revivals and miracles and restoration and for the word to go forth. Come on, somebody. Like God will do a good work in the midst of when everything is under great pressure. And all the while, God's saying, don't burst, but be refined. For our church, that's my prayer, is don't burst, but be refined. And that's why right here, Paul, Paul says in verse 7, he says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power. Power that, that is explosive and dynamic. The, the power of God, the power that rose Jesus from dead himself. And also the, the, the thing of love, the love of Jesus and self-discipline. Meaning it says you can do it because you are found in God. You can do the things I've called you to do. Even in the midst of Emperor Nero's craziness, you can do it because your life is found in Jesus' church. You can do the things that God has called you to do in the midst of North Platte or wherever he's calling you to be at. Not because of who you are, but because of who you put your faith in. This is what Paul's saying right here. The good work is not just going to happen by itself. The good work of, of being refined, it's just not going it, it, to, it's a cooperation. God is not going to force you to be refined. I love what Romans 8, 15, Paul is so big on this. He says, so you have not received a spirit of fear, a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Papa father. It's a partnership. Why? Because you and I, if you believe in Jesus, you are a child of God. You are his inheritance. It's a cooperation. Let's continue reading, starting at verse 8, down through 11. So never be ashamed. Everyone say ashamed. ashamed. Everyone say good? 
Everyone say work. work. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. And don't be ashamed of me either, even though I'm in prison for him. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. If you can unline that last part, I encourage you. For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was the plan from the beginning of time to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. Verse 10. And now he made all of this plain to us by appearing of Christ Jesus, our Savior. He broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and in immortality through the good news. And God chose me to be a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of this good news news. Just a side note. Anytime you read Paul says, God has asked me to do this. God has made me this. Let me tell you, that is your calling as well. Your calling is never just to be an attender of the Rock Church. Your calling that God has given you, first and foremost, that you are his child. And you're to go out and be an apostle and a preacher for the sake of the good news. Here's kind of the second observation it's not the best one. I understand this. In fact, if this was kind of our motto, you probably wouldn't even walk through our doors. But this is it. The good news or the good work may require suffering. Suffering. It's not a good word, is it? Just saying it is just suffering enough. It is like a cuss word, if you will. I do, Suffering, if I, if I see it, if I hear it, if I smell it, I will walk away. In fact, I will sprint the opposite direction. I want nothing to do with suffering. And Paul says right here, he says, hey, be ready to suffer. Be ready to suffer. In fact, let me do this this morning. This is like, does not teach you at all in Bible school to do this because this is like absolutely no, no. That if you're here thinking about Jesus and following him, there's an element of suffering in it. There's going to be suffering in it. The reason they don't teach you to do that in Bible college is because it's not a very good evangelism tool. It's not like we're going to go out and serve day and say, come suffer with us, right? That's, that's like, we don't do that. But Paul says, Timothy, be ready to suffer just as I have for the sake of the good news. Where does the suffering come from? The, this, this essence of suffering that Paul is talking about. In fact, the, the suffering comes from the element of pain, of being shamed from walking with Jesus and upholding his plans and his principles in this world. Paul, he's once again in prison. If you know anything about Paul, he's probably one of the worst pastors because he's always in jail. Every time, he's always in prison. In fact, I mean, he just writes this letter. He says, hey guys, if you guys don't know, I'm in prison again. I'll just preach from you from here. I'll just write my letter and you kind of just pass it on. And so he's, he's in prison once again from upholding the ways of Jesus, upholding his concepts and his precepts and, and really going forth into a, 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 a kind of pre-Christian era saying, you know, there's a Jesus and you need to follow him. Come follow, come follow him as I follow him. And Nero's like, no. I'll throw you in prison. And what's sad about this part is that not only is Paul getting kind of the, the shame from, from Rome, but he's actually getting a lot of shame from the Christian church. You see, after a handful of times of being in prison for doing the work of Christ, the Christian church at that time says, Paul, we want nothing to do with you. In fact, you make, you make it as if the Christian faith might make us be in prison one day ourselves. We don't want what you're having. And Paul says, what I have is actually what Jesus wants to give you. But it may require suffering. The Christian church, they were actually ashamed of Paul because every time he shared about Jesus, Paul stirred things up. And the church was drawing attention to themselves where they didn't want any attention at all and fear of Emperor Nero. Can I tell you something? This goes for everyone here. And then we'll talk to the adults and then students. When you are living for Jesus, holding fast to his concepts and principles and living in the way that he desires you to live, you're going to draw attention to yourself. Some attention might be good. 
There might some, be some good conversation, kind of like serve day, right? You're picking up trash? Awesome. Yeah, you know, what's, where are you at? I'm like, we're from the, from the Rock Church. And awesome, that's cool. I'm like, yeah, we just love God. We're doing out here. You're serving us a hot breakfast? Yeah, we just want you to know that Jesus loves you. Oh, thank you. Like, like, those are good. That's good attention. But there might be some other attention down to you where, who do you say you serve? Jesus. Kind of a strict guy. Doesn't he hate people? Why is it only through him that we can have good to heaven? I don't believe in Jesus. He's more of a mythological figure. And there, you will experience an element of pain. And even, I would say, an element you will feel. I'm not saying you accept it, but you will almost feel just a layer of shame on your shoulders when you get into those conversations. And you will be tempted when that pressure rises in your walk with Jesus to back off in your walk completely. Let me talk to the adults in the room. When you go out and you are walking with Jesus and upholding the things that Jesus taught in both word and action, you will stick out in your workplace. You will stick out in your family. You will stick out in society, especially right now, because we live in an upside-down world. And when you are bringing forth the ways of Jesus and people say, well, <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean that you won't cheat on your, your spouse? Oh, because I'm faithful, because God is faithful. No, it's, it's very normal to do this. No. I'm not normal because I follow Jesus. When you go out and everyone's gossiping about their spouse, and you actually don't gossip, but you actually build them up and affirm them in your word and action in front of your coworkers, oh, that is weird. That is weird. Because that's shop talk. That's what, that's what you do. No, I don't do that because I follow Jesus. You may, you may, and I say persecuted very lightly in our context because we're, we're not getting threatened with jail yet. We're not getting threatened for our lives yet. But they may label you a goody two-shoes. Oh, holier than thou. That, twerp, that, that kind of type of thing. But it's true. You're going to stick out. Let me talk to the students. To the students in the room. Your school starts in the next couple weeks. And I thought, students listening closely, I thought school was hard when I was in school, which is not very long ago. I'm pretty young. You can laugh at that. Someone laughed at that. Yeah, it's okay. I'm a young pastor. Ha, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I thought it was hard. I even did something called the purity ring. I don't know if they do that anymore, but it's, it's essentially saying you're not going to have sex until you're married. And so it was a concept, and, and me and my buddies, we, we threw on these rings, and we're like, yeah, like, this, is, this is awesome. And in our minds, like, everyone in school is going to accept this. We go there. No, they did not accept that. No. <laughs> they're like, you guys look like idiots. <laughs> and I thought that was hard. But now school now, it's, it's difficult, and I recognize that. It is a very different world. In fact, it's one of those things that, that, that we are actually praying about uh, as, as far as, like, do we get involved in the school system? Because it's that backwards in it right now. And students, you are going into this, and you, you will, I, I, I don't want to put this on you, but you're going to experience it, but there are going to be times, even this year, where you're going to have to take a stand for what you believe in Jesus. I'm not talking about defending scripture and apologetics. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about they're going to be attacking you and your identity in Jesus. And saying, who do you think you are? And you will be feeling that pressure on your shoulders of backing off and saying, whoa, this is a lot. I'm going to kind of distance myself away from Jesus just a little bit so the pressure kind of goes off. But let me tell you, press into the pressure. Be refined by it. It's going to happen. Pressure's going to come, but we can either burst or we can be refined. 
And this is what Paul's getting Timothy ready for this. He's getting ready for all this. And he gives the key on how to do it in the latter part. How to suffer. And how to suffer well. Because we're going to suffer. Whether you're in school or you're an adult. You suffer with the strength that God gives you. Verse 8. With the strength that God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. It's only by God's strength that you'll get through it. The good work may require suffering. Let's go ahead and read 2 Timothy 12 through 16. It says, That is why I'm suffering here in prison. Paul's in prison. That's not, like, what a shock, right? But I'm not ashamed of it, for I know that the one whom I trust, and I'm sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted him until the day of his return. Verse 13. Hold on to the pattern of wholesome teaching you have learned from me, a pattern shaped by the faith and love that you have in Christ Jesus. Through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. As you know, everyone from the province of Asia has deserted me, even Phygelus and Hermogenes. Her, 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 don't name your kid that, because I'm not going to pronounce it. I practiced that, and I butchered it. Then he goes on, he says, May the Lord show special kindness to once for us and all his family, because he's often visited me and encouraged me. He was never ashamed of me when I was in chains. When he came to Rome, he searched everywhere until he found me. May the Lord show him special kindness on the day of Christ's return. And you know very well how helpful he was in Ephesus. Here, here's my last observation for this morning. Is that the good work is done by the faithful. The good work is done by the faithful. Did you, did you guys catch verse 13? Hold on to the pattern of wholesome teaching, which you learned from me. We live in a time of so many different voices in this world. But we also live in a time where there's a lot of differing voices, even within the Christian world. A lot of different voices. Some voices are good. Some voices you need to kind of lend your ear to and listen and glean from. But there are some voices. There are some voices. In fact, I would say there are many voices that we should run away from. There's a lot of voices that if you are not careful and you are not discerning through the Holy Spirit within you, you need to make sure you are far, far, far from, from them. So the question is, well, how do I know a good voice from a bad voice? Well, Paul says it right there. He says, hold on to the what? The pattern of wholesome teaching. And this is an issue right here because Paul is telling Timothy that he ought to hold on to the pattern of wholesome teaching, which means Timothy needs to make sure he's holding on to the real truth of what has been taught and holding on to truth that is not derived from a worldly place. So what's the pattern? Well, let me tell you. Here's the pattern. You and I are in desperate need of a Savior because we are lost in our sin. That's very key there. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in need of a Savior, but I don't think... I, but you're not a sinner. You were never a sinner before. Ah, huh? that, that's a flag. You and I, we are in desperate need of a Savior. Why? Because we were lost in our sin. We were dead in our transgressions. If we weren't, we wouldn't need a Savior. But we are in desperate need of a Savior. Not only that, we were doomed to die, but God sent His Son Jesus to pay the death and with his life, so that whoever would repent of their sins, that's a big one right there. You don't have to say sorry. You don't have to repent. Yes, you do. Why? Because if you didn't have to repent, there'd be no need of a Savior. You kind of see this pattern here? You had to repent of your sins and commit their lives to him and him only. Then they are seen as forgiven and made righteous and given eternal life. This is the pattern that Paul was talking about. And this is the pattern that we teach here at the Rock Church. And if you ever hear anything different from that pattern, run away. Leave the place. If I teach anything else from that, leave my church. Because that is not the pattern of wholesome teaching that Paul is trying to get Timothy saying, hey, this is what you need to hold to. This is not the pattern of teaching that we're going to teach here and say, hey, you need to do all these different things. But no, you need to know that you and I are in desperate need of saving. And at one point in my life, I was dead in my transgressions and I messed up and I messed up big time. And if I didn't get my life to God, I would be doomed to die in a place of all shame for eternity, which is called hell. 
but because I believe in Jesus and he's forgiven me and made me clean and whole, now I'm a righteous heir of Jesus. And with that, I spend eternity in heaven. If you're anything other than that, that is not the pattern of wholesome teaching. There's no ifs, there's no ands, and there's no buts. This is the pattern that Paul was talking about. And it's the message of Jesus Christ that he desires for his church. Believe it or not, there are voices in the church right now that talk a different pattern. Do you, boo? That's a very big one right now. Do you? What's your personality type? Go ahead, just, just live in that. You don't have to do that. Just, just do that. It's, it's, it's bad. A lot of times as a pastor, our job is actually, more times than not, is not actually introducing them to a person that they never met, but it's actually recorrecting how they see Jesus because there's so many different voices today. You have to watch out for that. Ephesians 4.14, this is what Paul says to the church of Ephesus. He says, then we'll be no longer like immature children. We won't be tossed and blown away by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to kick us with lies so clever they sound like truth got to hold on. Everyone say, hold on. Hold on to that pattern. Not only to hold on, but you're also to guard it. Let me wrap up with this, if the worship team wants to come up. Verse 14 says, guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. This part of the scripture, if you will, as we wrap up here, tune in though. Don't, Don't tune out yet. We'll get out here. It paints a picture that the truth that God entrusted to us needs to be protected because one day it might be attacked. And it will be. The truth that you hold of Jesus will be attacked in a manner of speaking. But Paul isn't talking about like you need to defend scripture. Paul isn't talking about like when people go there and you need to, you need to defend this Bible. Like you need to defend. Like Paul's not talking about that. First and foremost, we know that because the Bible wasn't even created when Paul was talking about this. But what he is talking about, he says, the truth that the Holy Spirit deposited within you. That's another translation that some of you might have. The truth that that, that is laid within you, that you know that you know that you know that you belong to Jesus and that Jesus is the Son of God and he's coming back again to take us back home and that the only way to the Father is through him and him only, that you know that to your innermost depths and your core. That you know that. And that truth of knowing, it's going to be attacked. Right now, we have one of the biggest fallouts of people. We call it deconstructing. Deconstructing in itself isn't a bad thing. But it can lead to another bad thing. Where it actually leaves you walking away from Jesus. Got a new new play there. (laughs) We'll get it. Hang on there. But he's talking about to guard this truth that has been entrusted to you means that you actually value. Everyone say value. That you value your relationship with Jesus. What do you do with things that are valuable? You take care of it. You hold on to it. You don't neglect it. You put your attention to it. And he says, make sure, make sure you guard it and make sure you value it. Let me ask you this question. How much do you value your relationship with Jesus? Some of us, especially like on days like today on Sunday, we can say, absolutely, yes, I value my relationship. I'm here, ain't I? And you'd probably be totally correct in saying that. But then there are days like Monday through Saturday where our relationship with Jesus actually might depreciate. Because we take that valuable thing and, and it, maybe we set it on the back burner for a little bit. And we'll, and we'll pick it back up. We'll, we'll throw in the microwave and nuke it up and do all these things and make sure it's all hot and ready for, for next Sunday. Like, like we'll, we'll do that. And that might sustain you for a while, but who here likes leftovers? Not me. Some of us, we, we might say, well, I might, I might box it up and I, I, I might just tuck it away in a closet and maybe every once in a while and then there's some of us says, you know what? I'm just gonna, 
I see it, I have it, I'm going to put it in a nice clean tote, and I'm going to put it in my storage unit, and I'm only going to bring it out on Christmas and Easter. I'll bring it out for the holidays, just like my decorations. And then there are some of us where we take it, and we, we look at it, and it was valuable at one point when it was given to us. We almost kind of treat it like, a, like an old toy that we received for Christmas a couple years ago, where it's like, it was good then, I just, I just don't see the value anymore. So you toss it away. And Paul's saying right here to Timothy, he's like, you are going to be in a culture where they're going to tell you that the value of following Jesus isn't as valuable as you may think it is. They're actually going to tell you to, to tuck it away, to hide it, to put it in the storage, just to, maybe just to get rid of it because culture says it has no value. But let me tell you, culture does not deem the value on your relationship with Jesus. Jesus does. And if he counts you valuable, we ought to count him even more valuable in our life. How much do you value your relationship with Jesus? To guard this truth that he's entrusted to you means that you actually value your relationship with Jesus with absolute faithfulness. I mean, that's what Paul's saying right here. He's encouraging Timothy to keep faithful. And I would implore you, every one of you, that in the times that we live in of, of unfaithfulness, in a time where the world is telling you to reject your faith, in a time of the world that's saying, there's no, it's no good, Jesus has no place here. I'm telling you, I encourage you, I implore you, as Paul is saying from a dark jail cell in the midst of Rome, about to get his head chopped off, he's telling Timothy, be faithful. I'm telling you, be faithful to Jesus. Fight for that faithfulness. Fight the good fight. Strive on. The pressure is going to increase. It's not going anywhere. You can either bust or you can be refined. To be refined is a cooperation and it takes work. To bust is just a natural, it's just a byproduct if you don't do anything, really. This is what Paul's talking about. The good work, it's a cooperation between you and Jesus. And it may require an element of suffering. I pray to God that element of suffering is not as hard as some countries that are dealing with right now. Our worlds would be rocked if it was. But let me tell you, it's only done by the faithful. This good work that Paul's talking about, it's only done by the faithful. This is the good work. Everyone say good. And we'll say work. work. We're going to be put under pressure, and our only options are to either burst or to be refined. So, will you guys stand? This morning is Communion Sunday. It's an open communion, meaning that if you have a relationship with Jesus, you can come forward. And you talk about this pressure, this idea of pressure. I mean, Scripture tells of the account of Jesus praying in the garden. He was under so much pressure that he was sweating drops of blood. I mean, you talk about pressure, that is, that's another level right there. But Jesus says something very important at that time where he's saying, Lord, he says, God, I, I pray that you would have this cup kind of just pass before me. I don't want to go into this. But he ends it with something very important. He says, not my will be done, but yours. And this is why we have communion this morning. It's because moments before that, he had the Last Supper with his disciples, and, and they're having bread and, and, and wine. And as they're eating these, these two very normal elements in, in their culture, he says, you know what, this bread, as often as you eat of it, you, you're going to eat this three times a day, every single day of your life. As often as you eat this bread, think of me. Translation, think about me all the time. Because this, 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 this bread is my body. And he picks up the, the cup of wine. He says, as often as you drink from the wine, which is in their culture is, is every day for most meals. He says, as often as you drink from the fruit of the vine, think of me. Because this wine that you're drinking, it represents my blood. So as often as you just eat these normal meals, Think of my body and my blood that was given up for you. Think about me all the time. Think about the sacrifice that I'm making for you. And so as the church, we do that. We think about that.
And we honor that. We do it once a month. And so this morning, I'm going to pray for you, and we're going to come down the center of the aisle. You're going to grab a hold of a piece of bread and a cup of juice and return your seats on the outside. Hold on to them. We're going to take them together. I'm going to pray for us as we do. But as you guys are singing this song and as you guys are reflecting and thinking about pressure and what I've talked about and thinking about what Jesus did on the cross, I pray that the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit would speak to you very loudly and clearly of the magnitude of the time that we live in right now and what it means to follow Jesus, the Son of God that died on a cross like that. So let's pray. Father, this morning, we're going to dedicate the next few moments in remembering you through communion. And we're going to honor you as your body was brought forth and your blood was poured out so that I can stand here today fully freed and forgiven. And I know the opportunity is the very same. Really quick, if you don't know Jesus Christ this morning, Scripture says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you can know that you can be saved. You can say a simple prayer just saying, Lord, would you come into my life? Would you forgive me of my sins? Today I'm following after you. I'm not leading myself anymore. I commit my life to you, Jesus. And just that prayer of faith, we believe here at the Rock Church that you are saved because you said it and you believe it. Lord, would you bless the next few moments. Once you're ready, please come down the center aisle, grab hold of the elements, hold on to them, return to your seats on the outside.
hands we hold a piece of bread and a cup of juice again just very normal elements things that we consume on a daily basis God says take these normal things and as often as you drink from the cup and, and eat of the of the bread think of me think of my sacrifice think of what I've done think of what I've given up not just for myself but for you because I love you I adore you I value you and would in return, would you commit your life to me? And that from that, I give you eternal life. So would you pray for me? God, we thank you for what you did on the cross. Can everyone say, say thank you this morning? Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. And Lord, we know that you did not stay on the cross and you did not stay dead. But you defeated death, hell, and the grave. So that I can stand here, so that everyone can stand here and have the opportunity to know you and to be forgiven and to be set free. And so, Lord, we take a part of the bread. We take a part of the fruit. And we say, Jesus, thank you for this. Thank you for what you've done. You may partake. Let's go back in that song and sing one more time. as you guys go out today, go out in the real world, go out to the restaurant, go and grab some quick bite to eat, going back home as you continue your regular week tomorrow. Remember, we're going to be put under pressure. We have two options. You can either bust or be refined. My prayer for you as God's child that you be refined underneath this intense pressure that we're in and you will come out better than you did becoming in will come out better than you did coming in. Amen? Amen. That concludes today. I will see you guys next week. I'd love to meet anyone that's new here right outside. Take care.